Um, just one or two words of welcome to our speakers. Hoping you'll be happy to, uh, to be recorded. So, Wilma Jacobson was the first Anglican woman deacon and priest ordained by Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu in 1988, and then from and then 1992, and was chaplain to him from 1995 until his retirement in 96. Tra she tra Wilma trained at Fuller Theological Seminary in California, Union Theological Seminary in New York, and St Paul's Theological College in Grahamstown in South Africa then served in St. George's Cathedral in Cape Town, Township Churches, and the Anglican University Chaplaincy in the Diocese of Cape Town, followed by 17 years in the Episcopal Church in California, USA, at Peace and Justice Church, All Saints Church, Pasadena, and St. Jude's Church in Cupertino, Silicon mm -hmm. Valley. Wilma, you can challenge this at the end if you need to, Wilma, if I've got any of this wrong. Hopefully it's right. She's yeah. a, Wilma is a former provincial chaplain of the Anglican Student Fellowship of AXA, the Anglican Church of Southern Africa, coordinator for Episcopal Relief and Development, and co-chair of the Urban Intern Mission Programme in the Diocese of Los Angeles. Currently coordinator of the Ecumenical Volmerd Youth Leadership Training Programme and the chaplain at CCN partner Volmerd Retreat and Conference Centre in the Western Cape. Reconciliation and justice were important formative influences for her through her involvement in the student Christian movement, Taze community and All Saints Church Pasadena in California. Her strongest personal, the strongest personal influence on her was Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu. Wilma, um, it's lovely to have you here. Um, thank you for joining us virtually. Um, uh, and we hope to welcome you to Coventry um, uh, uh, physically at some point. Um, but we're with you for up to 20 minutes as you talk a little bit more about Archbishop Desmond Tutu and his impact upon you and your life and ministry. Thank you so much. Really good to be connected to everyone virtually from a chilly and rainy Cape Town. <laughs> but good afternoon, everyone. I do greet you in the name of our living, loving, life-giving God from the Fulmwood Retreat Center. Uh, which is a partner of the community of the Cross of Nails since 2006. Thank you for the invitation to reflect on reconciliation and justice and to celebrate the life and legacy of Archbishop Desmond and Pilo Tutu. I feel such a privilege to participate in these 60th anniversary celebrations of Coventry Cathedral and the community of the Cross of Nails from afar. I'm also delighted to be speaking together with Reverend Mpot Tutu. Her journey and mine have connected at times for special and cherished moments when geography has permitted. I've learned much from her over the years and treasure this connection. Reconciliation, justice. How do we remain loyal both to the demand of those who are oppressed for justice and to the gift of forgiveness and reconciliation that Jesus the crucified offered to the perpetrators. What does it mean to be a citizen of the world and a country at war and a follower of Jesus Christ the crucified? I resonate with these questions asked by Miroslav Wolf in his book, Exclusion and Embrace. And he was asked in, back in 1993 as a Croat but can you embrace a Setnik, the notorious Serbian fighters who had in Croatia destroyed cities, burned down churches, raped women, and herded people into concentration camps? His answer was, no, I cannot. But as a follower of Christ, I think I should be able to. As a South African, I wrestled with this through the years of the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and still wrestle with these questions as decades later, our nation continues to struggle with racial reconciliation and the tragically incomplete process of the journey towards justice, equity, reconciliation, and Ubuntu. Archbishop Desmond Tutu is our national and global icon who led us to deeper understandings of reconciliation and justice and insisted that there is no future without forgiveness. 
He said, for our nation to heal and become a more humane place, we had to embrace our enemies as well as our friends. The same is true the world over, true enduring peace between countries within a country, within a community, within a family, requires real reconciliation between former enemies and even between loved ones who have struggled with one another. He continued, true reconciliation is based on forgiveness and forgiveness is based on true confession. And confession is based on penitence, on contrition, on sorrow for what you have done. We know that when a husband and wife have quarreled, one of them must be ready to say the most difficult words in any language, I am sorry. And the other must be ready to forgive for there to be a future for their relationship. This is true between parents and children, between siblings, between neighbors and between friends. As he said, equally, confession, forgiveness and reconciliation in the lives of nations are not just airy fairy religious and spiritual things, nebulous and unrealistic. They are the stuff of practical politics. Dayenu, that would have been enough. And yet there is more. The legacy of Archbishop Tutu stretches far and long and wide. I believe that for years to come, we will be discovering that his legacy goes much deeper than we know at present. Most people immediately associate him with reconciliation and justice, the focus of our reflection today, and with the TRC, the forgiveness and justice and peacemaking. For those of us who knew him, worked with him, listened to him, it is so much more. Personally, I am beyond grateful for Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Dumpilo Tutu. He's one of the most important influences on my spirituality, my understanding of reconciliation and justice and on my priesthood. I clearly remember the first time I met him. I was a young campus ministry intern in a car with him and Michael Cassidy of Africa Enterprise traveling from Peter Maritzburg to Durban. And they were in the front conversing about their recent encounters with then apartheid Prime Minister P.W. Water. I was the pipsqueak in the back seat. But halfway there, the Archbishop turned to me and said, now tell me about yourself. And I started telling him about my internship and my activities as a faith-based activist. And he said, no, no, not what you do. Tell me who you are. His interest in me as a person and the presence with which he listened and reflected, reflected who he was. Someone who affirmed the being and dignity of others, no matter their age or who they were. This is partly just who he was as a remarkable person. He paid as much attention to the little people as he did with the highest international leaders. He interacted with each person with his full attention. But it was also rooted in the faith and theology that undergirded his personal interactions, his wide ranging activism and commitment to speak out and act for justice, both collectively and globally, and justice for individuals. He believed that every human being is created in the image of God to be reverenced and held in awe as if she or he is God or they are God. In mass gatherings, he would encourage us to say out loud, Loudly, I am a VSP, a very special person, because all human beings, all of us, are made in the image of God. Therefore, to mistreat another human being is not simply unjust, nor simply painful for the victim. It's blasphemous, because for him it was, as he said, spitting in the face of God. His theology, his faith, had concrete implications for how people and the environment were to be treated. John Allen, his media PA and aide said that if there was one thing that had outraged him, it was to see the powerful inflict suffering on so-called ordinary people. So-called because in my theology, nobody is ordinary. Archbishop Tutu was passionate about inclusion, that God welcomes all people, that Jesus said, I will draw all people to myself and meant it with no exceptions. At a sermon at All Saints Church, Pasadena, in 2006, he said, Jesus didn't say, I, if I be lifted up, will draw 
some. Jesus said, if I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all, 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 all. And then he said, Bush and Bin Laden and the whole congregation gasped. Black, white, yellow, rich, poor, clever, not so clever, beautiful, not so beautiful. He said, it's one of the most radical things. All, all, all belong. Gay, lesbian, so-called straight, all, all are meant to be held in this incredible embrace that will not let us go. That was him. And he didn't only speak about inclusion as a principle of the liberation theology he embraced, he lived it out. He walked the talk. He brought his black and African liberation theology into his spirituality, global prophetic preaching and priestly ministry. For him, faith and action, contemplation, prayer and activism, or theology and praxis, justice and reconciliation go hand in hand. They cannot be separated. They flow back and forth, integrally connected. For him, justice is reconciliation. Archbishop Tutu had a fundamental core belief in God's love as universal love that welcomes everyone, absolutely everyone, even the worst sinners, the worst offenders, that love and grace triumphs in every way over all else, that the most horrendous situations can be transfigured, that love wins. For him, reconciliation is grounded in love. Justice is grounded in love. Justice is reconciliation connected by love grounded in God's love, overflowing into all of creation and all of humanity. Grounded in the unstoppable love of Jesus the Christ, who showed us how to live, how to love, how to walk the way of love. Jesus, who reached out with love and healing to those on the margins, the invisible, the untouchable, who confronted religious authorities, who lived, by, who lived by legalism and purity laws. Jesus, who walked toward betrayal and torture and death, offered up his life on the cross, showed us how to die, trusting even in his abandonment on the cross, that God's love was strong enough to bring him through death to resurrection. Jesus' death is seen as the groundbreaking encounter with human evil, and he met the violence of his death with the power of nonviolence, with the power of love and the power of truth, producing a different kind of power, a power as compassion and love, as opposed to power as control and domination. This death-defying power of compassion and love is power that transforms lives and can bring reconciliation and justice to the most hopeless situations. Jesus, who challenged the dominant powers in the ultimate way, met the torture and violence handed out to him, not with violence, but with this nonviolent, powerful love. Jesus died to establish a new beloved community and for us to become a part of it, to realize that across the world, across that which divides us and unites us as human beings, we are kin, we are family and we are responsible for each other. That as my former rector Ed Bacon would say, our mission is to turn the human race into the human family. When one part of the body, the family suffers, we also suffer. Therefore, the work of reconciliation and the work of justice are central to our humanity as the body of Christ. That's the power of love and compassion over the power of violence and control producing the possibility of reconciliation and justice, the possibility of transformation. But what do we mean by reconciliation? Theologically, reconciliation is at the heart of Christian faith and belief. It has a variety of meanings. And is associated primarily with belief about the triune God saving work in Jesus Christ and can be interchangeably used with the words redemption, salvation, atonement. There are different biblical metaphors and different biblical ways to understanding all of these. 
And Paul links his use of the word reconciliation with God's justice, reflecting both the understanding of God's action and the understanding of human beings in social relationship. It has both a vertical and a horizontal dimension. Reconciliation has to do with God relating to us, the human other, and in turn, our relationships with the other or groups. And John Grutti says that reconciliation is fundamentally about God making us friends and us restoring relationships with others. Think of the Sermon on the Mount. If anyone has something against you, go, leave your gift on the altar and first be reconciled to your brother or sister and then come and offer your gift. Reconciliation is more than a code word for God's work of restoring God's people to God's self. It's a way of life towards which Christians are called in this world, sharing in Christ's ministry of reconciliation, about breaking down walls of enmity between Jews and Gentiles, slaves and free, males or females, and in these days between different races, nationalities, classes, genders, sexual orientations, age, age groups, those who are differently abled and between humans and the environment. Thus the call is to live out the gospel of reconciliation through the spirit at work in us with hope for God's restoration and renewal of the whole creation that anticipates the coming of God's reign of justice and peace. Reconciliation takes on different forms depending on the context. More securely defined, it's the processes of building or rebuilding relationships that have been damaged or breached after violations of trust or human rights or violence. It's hard work. It takes courage and perseverance. Reconciliation can be personal, interpersonal, institutional or sociopolitical, and it can be a combination of these. In South Africa, we made it a national process through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Archbishop Tutu referred often to true reconciliation or real reconciliation, implying and also saying that reconciliation that simply papers over the cracks will, will not last and isn't real. Perhaps akin to Dietrich Bonhoeffer's cheap grace or costly grace, it's sometimes talked about as thin or thick re reconciliation. The thin or minimal understandings of reconciliation involve individuals, groups, or institutions peacefully coexisting, but with little or no trust, respect, or shared values between them. Thicker versions of reconciliation involve relationships built on trust, respect, and shared values, which may all contribute to the restoration of dignity that may have been lost as a result of violations. There's nothing easy about reconciliation. It's painful, it's slow, it's risky. It goes forward and backwards and forwards again, incrementally. Archbishop Tutu said that forgiving and being reconciled to our enemies or our loved ones are not about pretending that things are other than they are. It isn't about patting one another on the back and turning a blind eye to the wrong. True reconciliation exposes the awfulness, the abuse, the hurt, the truth, can even make things worse. It's a risky undertaking, he said, but in the end it's worthwhile because only an honest confrontation with reality can bring real healing. When it comes to the TRC, it was based on a largely religious concept of reconciliation as well as Ubuntu, the African understanding that I am a person through an other persons. I exist because you exist. We exist in an interdependence. And I can only be who I am because of you. I am human because I recognize your humanity. Ubuntu emphasizes our common humanity in order to promote broader concepts of healing and harmony. What about justice? Justice, says Bishop John Hines, former presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, justice is the corporate face of love. We are to love one another as Jesus loves us. We are to love God and our neighbor as ourselves. 
My own conversion as a young white South African student was the moment I heard in the context of a student conference where students of all races had gathered for the first time in decades, back in 1979. The reminder to love God, love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And for the first time in my young white life, I wondered, what does it mean to love my neighbor as myself if my neighbor is a black South African? And clearly to me, it meant to work for the same rights and privileges I had as a white South African. The decision to take that seriously changed my life then and still drives my own passion and work for justice and equality. Justice in the scriptures has different understandings. There's sacrificial justice and forensic justice, but both, says Nico Koopman, fit with justice as compassionate justice. God declares us just through the work of redemption of Jesus Christ. Justified people seek justice in the world and human rights for all. This compassionate justice doesn't seek revenge, but is merciful. It seeks the healing of broken relationships. This is the restorative justice that was the basis of the TRC. When it comes to reconciliation and justice, many people in South Africa thought the TRC was too much of a compromise, that the quest for truth and reconciliation was at the cost of necessary justice. However, their concept of justice focused on retribution and retributive justice. Do we not as humans long for the wicked to be punished? for our enemies to receive their just reward. The desire for revenge and for justice fuels anger and prevents reconciliation. Archbishop Tutu explained that in Africa, in his words, we have had a jurisprudence that wasn't retributive, but restorative. When people quarreled, the main intention was not to punish the miscreant, but to restore good relations. For Africa is concerned or has traditionally been concerned about the wholeness of relationship. We need this in our world, our polarized, fragmented world. We need this in our families and friendships, for restoration heals and makes whole, while retribution only wounds and divides us mm -hmm. from, my, from, from each other. In my understanding, restorative justice views crime as a wrong against another person, not as a depersonalized breaking of the law. It attends to the broken relationships between the offender, the victim, and the community. It holds offenders directly accountable to the people they have harmed and restores, to the extent possible, emotional and material losses of victims by providing opportunities for dialogue and negotiation and problem, and problem solving. Archbishop Tutu said, restorative justice is hopeful. It believes that even the worst offender can become a better person. And the ultimate aim is one of healing. This manner of healing gives the actual victims and the community, as well as offenders, the opportunity to take an active part in the justice process. I'm attracted to this notion of compassionate justice. When people who engage in caring and compassionate justice are focused on the quest for communion between independent, interdependent human, humans, called into communion with the triune God, we are on the way to a life of reconciliation or embrace. There's another way of thinking about uh, justice in terms of restitution and thinking about all the long list of injustices and injuries and harms experienced by people over the years. It's a way of uh, making right. And back in August, 2011, Archbishop Tutu spelled out the agenda for restitutive forgiveness. He pleaded for restitution as a rehumanization of wounded and dehumanized persons. He called for economic restitution and asked senior government officials to share their personal resources and called for white resourceful people to consider paying a form of wealth tax. He called for psychological restitution. All of this would have gone a long way to making change and reconciliation and racial reconciliation different in our country. Sadly, it hasn't happened. 
Restitution focuses on the past and on the future, seeks symbolic reparations or sometimes material reparation. And tragically, in the years following the TRC, the intended reparations for victims who told their stories for the most part didn't materialize as planned and those that did took a long time. Perhaps we would be further on the road journey of reconciliation than we are today if, they, if, that ha if they'd been rolled out as planned. Archbishop Tutu acknowledged that the TRC was flawed and he said, despite that, I want to assert that it was in an imperfect world, the best possible instru instrument so far devised to deal with the kind of situation that confronted us after democracy was established in the motherland. He saw it as a sign of hope. And of course, he said that God must have had a sense of humor for using South Africa, such a hopeless case, to bring hope for the world. There are, of course, many examples of reconciliation and justice. And I'll name them now and perhaps can go into more detail uh, in the discussion. But one, I call it maybe a soft example, but it's personal to me, was in our provincial synod back in 1992, when we, uh, for the second time, tried to pass a resolution to ordain women priests. And we expected maybe to squeak by the two thirds mark, but maybe not. And unbelievably and completely surprisingly, the vote ended up as 79.2%, completely unexpectedly. Now that was intense. It was a day long proceedings and the Archbishop had requested silence, no clapping, no verbal responses, whatever the outcome. And this was personally monumentally challenging after all the years of waiting. He then immediately had a resolution ready to say that the church cherished and treasured those who could not agree to the ordination of women priests. And this passed. And this included several bishops well known to be opposed who could have led a breakaway of the Anglican church had they wanted to do that. And to be completely honest, I hadn't seen that coming and it was a struggle. And I sat on my hands and I abstained. I somehow just could not lift up my hand to vote. The resolution passed and several speeches were made by those opposed to women's ordination, affirming their sense of belonging in the church. And it was his plan to keep the church united. And as difficult as that moment was for some of us, it worked. And so his foresight and intentionality to ensure that everyone felt welcome in our church, no matter what they believed at women's ordination as priests, uh, ensured that we stayed together as a church. There are other examples, I'll just name them now for reasons of time, but there's the parent circle in Israel and Palestine, created in 1995 by a Jewish parent whose eldest son was abducted and murdered by Hamas. It's now a joint Palestinian-Israeli organization of over 600 Israeli and Palestinian families, all of whom have lost a close family member as, as a result of the prolonged violent conflict. Archbishop Tutu spent time with them during one of his visits to the Holy Land. Other examples, of course, many from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that we can talk about in the discussion. And of course, not, it's not limited to South Africa or to Israel and Palestine. There is examples of the restorative justice movement in the USA and uh, stories of, of, of parents of a young man who was shot who ended up visiting their son's murderer in jail, which everyone said not to do. And the bottom line, you can ask me about it later, is they wondered um, why so many children had no home while their son's room in their home stood empty. And the time came when they asked the young man who'd been serving time in jail for killing their son, if they could take him into their home, if he would allow them to become his adoptive parents. And what seems so impossible to think about in theory becomes possible when there's openness and courage and a willingness to change, to embrace the other, to walk the journey of restorative justice that brings healing. Wilma, I think I'm going to ask you to draw to a close so that we can, I think people may may find it difficult to take more in. Uh, are there a few other, are there some things that you want to say just to finish up with? Absolutely, I can do that very quickly. We're on the home stretch, yes. Mm. I kind of wanted to say that was then, this is now, because it's, it's, it's context specific in many ways. And ask the question, does Archbishop's Tutu legacy of reconciliation and justice 
still peak to our world now, and we can discuss that. Mm-hmm. And to note that just in, in South Africa, it's hard for young, young people, young generations, mainly black generations born after apartheid, who question the approach of reconciliation and forgiveness of both Nelson Mandela and Archbishop Tutu because of the lack of restitution and reparations. And again, we can talk about that in the discussion. And so um, we are challenged in this country enormously and of course challenged in the world. And so this man, uh, Archbishop Tutu, shaped the moral landscape of reconciliation and justice and his legacy will continue long into the future. And he said, so often let us work together with each other and with God to make God's dream a reality. There we are. Thank you. Absolutely outstanding, um, Wilma. Um, I, I think because I know that you'd given a transcript to Delene in case your internet dropped, I'm guessing that means that you may have a script. And if you were willing to share that with us, uh, I think people will be really grateful, especially those for whom English is not their first language, um, who have been, you know, for those of us that, that is, there was so yeah. much of richness in there, but for those, uh, for others to take in all of that. So um, uh, if that would be possible, that would be wonderful. I'm and happy think, to do that. Thank you. Um, I, I mean, I think I might have, I hesitated to do this, but I might almost have, have subtitled your talk, Making Reconciliation Real. Um, the the legacy of Desmond Tutu because there was such a lot about um, mm. taking it into reality and the need for restoration and reparation and those two questions that you left us with which I'm not going to open up now but we'll come back to um, does his legacy still appeal to our world and and what's the what's the uh, what's the reflection on it particularly maybe from South Africa um, in terms of did it actually transform things in the way that that people have. Mm. Um, I'm going to suggest, because we've been really attentive for quite a while, I'm going to suggest that we actually just take two or three minutes just to kind of do a bit of a shake before we come back and listen to Umpo. Um, is that OK? So um, let's take, um, uh, uh, as I say, two or three minutes and then let's just and then we'll, re, re, we'll regather to listen to, um, to Umpo share with us. So um, uh, Feel free to um, switch off if you want to, or just shake where you are. Okay. Amazing um, input from uh, from Wilma, um, and people have just taken. I'm sure you listened to that, Umpo. It was extraordinary, wasn't it? Um, uh, really, really rich. So um, indeed, yeah. Um, and so, have the two of you um, done things together before? Um, have you been used to working together, or is that is this a new experience? Okay. This is a new one. Okay. Okay. Well. Um, well. Um, again, huge thanks to Wilma. Um, 
uh, for that for that introduction. Umpo, I have had the pleasure of listening to you at the Greenbelt Festival. Um, mm. uh, I hope you have happy memories of being at Greenbelt, um, uh, an extraordinary place. And like so many people, um, have um, have really uh, appreciated the book of forgiving, um, which I've also been able to share with others. So um, that's one of the things that you were partially at least responsible for. So really grateful for that. So I'm just going to um, uh, encourage people to rejoin. We'll give people a moment rather than um, uh, rather than uh, frustrating them. But what I might do just as people are rejoining us, I'm just going to remind you briefly of, of uh, Umpo's uh, um, uh, biography, um, which will give people a chance to come in. So, incredibly happy to be welcoming the Reverend Umpo Tutu van Firth. Is it Firth or Firth, uh, Umpo? I'm so Second, Firth. So, Firth. Okay, fit. Okay, I should have guessed that. I was, I, sh I kind of tried to practice it beforehand, but anyway. Um, and you are an Anglican priest, speaker, writer, theologian, artist, mother, and youngest daughter, of course, of uh, the world famous South African Archbishop and human rights activist Desmond Tutu. And grandmother. You grew up the elect. Say that again. And grandmother. <laughs> and grandmother. Oh, my gosh. That feels quite hard to believe, actually. But anyway, um, <laughs> fantastic. Uh, and yeah, well, as one grandfather to one grandmother, greetings. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, went on to study electrical engineering and work with refugees in the United States. And uh, you were, amongst other things, founder and director uh, of the Tutu Institute for Prayer and Pilgrimage and director of the Desmond and Leah Tutu Legacy Foundation that strives for peace and justice. You married Dutch professor of pediatrics, Marceline van Voet in 2015, supported by your father, but sadly meaning that you needed to resign your priesthood in the South African church, which is a great sadness. And we long for the day when that may not be the case anymore. Umpo was appointed pastor of the Vreiburg Church in Amsterdam in 2022, and you're committed to helping young women flourish and to encourage them to make their voices heard, but feel passionately about diversity, inclusivity, racism, emancipation, forgiveness, mentoring, equality, happiness, leadership, justice, and meaning, which is enough to keep you going. The philosophy of Ubuntu lies at the heart of your commitment, that we are only who we are through our connection with other people, our humanity is intertwined, and every crack in the fabric of our connectedness must be repaired. So, Umpu, thank you for being with us, um, uh, and we really look forward to what you have to say. Um, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm um, really thrilled to uh, be a part of today's conversation. Um, I know some of my favorite images of my father. He um, is wearing his Coventry cross. Um, that was one that was probably one of his most frequently worn um, pectoral crosses. Um, and I admit to not being 100% um, sure where to begin. Um, I, I know uh, that running in my mind is uh, very often the observation that um, my father feels too alive to be dead. Um, he he um, was a person of such vigor and energy that um, the world seems to have tipped on its axis slightly um, in, in this, this sense of his absence. Um, but when, when I speak of my father and think about his ministry of reconciliation, um, my father's day life, um, day began in prayer, um, continued in prayer and ended in prayer. And um, reconciliation was for him 
not a cerebral undertaking, and although my father was a very widely and deeply read theologian, um, his theology didn't live in his head. Um, it lived in his bones. It lived in his being. Um, reconciliation was not for him an optional extra in how he practiced his faith, um, but was core and central to how he practiced his faith. Um, I, I remember as a teenager um, being at Regina Mundi, which is the Roman Catholic Cathedral in Soweto, um, for one of those uh, church services that were actually rallies when um, when we were uh, living under one of several states of emergency, um, under the South African government states of emergency, uh, political rallies would be banned, but because we were a Christian country, um, church services couldn't be banned. And so um, on occasions of moment, we would gather for a church service and um, the political speeches would happen in the context of a church service. Um, but at the end of this particular church service, um, as, as the crowds began to exit the cathedral, um, we saw a line of um, cassipers of, of um, armored personnel vehicles that were surrounding the cathedral. Um, and it's not clear whether it was a, a stone that was thrown first or a tear gas canister that was hurled first, but the predictable mayhem ensued. And I just remember my father had this um, a black uh, cape, um, and and I you know could have saw him going between the the young people who were trying to decide whether it was safe to leave the environs of the church and the um, commander of the troops that were ranged outside. Um, trying to calm down um, both sides. And um, after the encounter and when things had, had calmed down significantly, um, my father made a statement to the press um, thanking the commander for um, the restraint that he demonstrated in that, in that moment. And um, I, I asked him, why did you do that? And he said, you know, if I am willing to challenge them when they do the wrong thing, I must be equally willing to stand up and speak out when they do the right thing. I, I think now in, um, in a time of war in Europe again, um, and in a time of conflict all over the world, um, how little attention we pay to the small attentions that pave the way for reconciliation. Um, we are willing to characterize war in Ukraine as Putin's war um, and then ignore the fact that those who are fighting, those on the front lines are not Putin. Um, those on the front lines are somebody's son, somebody's brother, somebody's father, who are there because they serve in the military of their country. 
Um, and while we admire the courage of the Ukrainians, um, we have very little attention for the anguish of those Russians who have lost loved ones in this war. We um, talk as though we imagine that the war will be over and, and one day we will put a check mark on this place in history and be able to say we are done. And yet we know that wars once begun are never really done. They live in memory. They live in devastation. They live in lives lost. They live in costs to our economies. Um, and they live in the ways that we continue to talk about each other um, as people who are less than human, less than those who are beloved of God. Um, my father said that Christ's proclamation was that I, if I be lifted up, will draw all to me. And in his all, Christ would have drawn Bush and Bin Laden. Um, God, Christ draws in to himself, Putin, as well as Zelensky, as well as Biden. And do we have space in our hearts and our minds to, to hold that reality, that vision of Christ? What does reconciliation mean? Not just in the context of war, but in the context of the small wars that we wage daily in our communities and our lives and the spaces that we make space for unkindness in the ways that we make space for discrimination and racism, in the ways that we make space, that we give permission for gender-based violence through the violence of our words. How do we craft reconciliation if we refuse to live reconciliation? if we refuse to live as those who see in front of us in the faces of each and every person that we see, an icon, uh, an image that lets us see through to the beauty of God. Um, I was taught that one does not buy an icon, um, one is given an icon. And, um, and if one desires an icon but has not yet been given, then just walk out in the streets and look. And on each face that you see, you will see a glimpse of the face of God. My father lived that in ways that surprised me and challenged me. Um, recently, I was um, writing a, a piece for the um, My Theology series, writing about reconciliation, reparation, and forgiveness. And um, I, I had a chance for a small piece of conversation with my father um, about what I was writing. And, um, and it was from him that I 
God's the word of um, humility and not humiliation. That, um, that true reparations can only begin in humility. Um, when we are humiliated, we feel small and we want to fight back. But when we are humble, um, we have a true sense of who we are. When we are humble, we know ourselves to be that combination of earth being filled with the breath of God. Um, the, the image from the book of Genesis of, of God making mud people um, and, you know, uh, in the, uh, making people out of mud and then breathing God's breath into this mud being. Um, we too are those made out of earth and filled with the breath of God. And if we recognize ourselves to be so, um, how can we but bow down before each other um, and honor each other? Um, how can we but be humble before each other and humble within ourselves knowing that we breathe the breath of God? that we are created in the image and likeness of God, that we um, deserve not only politeness, but reverence. Um, and how, how, would, how differently would we walk in the world if we were walking as people who have that clear, knowledge of being God creatures, God carriers, breathing in our breath, the breath of God. I miss my dad. <laughs> um, I miss his laughter. I miss his joy. I miss the clarity of his vision, and I miss his genuine humility. He was one who was willing to admit that he did not know what he did not know, that he could not do what he could not do, that other people were better at things than he was. He could relish um, talent and ability in another, enjoy it, thrill in it. Um, I miss um, I miss his laughter, and I miss having this person walking in the world to whom I could turn not for a cerebral knowledge and wisdom, but to whom I could turn to look at a way of being that was reconciling. Um, my father, as, as Wilma alluded to, um, was involved in so many causes that all looked disparate. He, his hand was in this and he was the patron of that. It was dance, it was environment, it was anti-war, it was health. They all looked like you know, you name it, he was involved in it. Um, and what tied all of the causes that my father subscribed to, to which my father, my father was an English teacher, he would have punished me for that. <laughs> the, the thing that tied together all of the 
causes to which my father subscribed was a single ethic and that was the ethic of love. Um, and if you wanted to know where he would land on an issue, all you had to ask was, where would love be? What would be the most loving thing? And you may or may not agree with him on any issue, but you would know at least that the way that he got to where he landed was by following the ethic of love. And we would do ourselves no harm to do the same. Thank you so much for your attention and blessing. Wow. Let's just keep quiet for a moment just to share in that and just to allow um, Unpo's dad just to be with us for a moment longer. That was um, that was really extraordinary, Umpo. Thank you so much, um, and thank you, Wilma. Um, uh, that's been an incredible input for us. Um, I'm going to suggest that we take a ten minute break, um, just so that we've got a proper chance, just to kind of refresh ourselves, get a drink if you want to. Then we'll come back together. We'll spend some time in plenary for questions and comments that you may have. Then we're going to use some breakout groups just to make sure that everybody gets a chance to speak before we come back together again. So let's take 10 minutes. Um, so that's 10 to the hour, uh, whichever hour you happen to be in. Um, and, uh, and we'll gather back again um, all together. But I just want to say again, thank you as we go into our break to Umpo. Just extraordinary. And Wilma's, the richness of Wilma's input. So it's been incredible. Thank you so much. So I'll see you again in 10 minutes.